Uh, for anyone who joined uh, just now, uh, I'm gonna send in the chat the link for uh, downloading the files, so you, you can get, you guys can follow along. I think we can start if Sophia wants to present. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Sophia, and I'm from the admissions team. And I'm here to introduce our boot camp as well as to answer any immediate questions you might have. So let me now share my screen. All right. And be sure to, if you have a question, click on the chat button and make sure that it is selected to everybody so that everyone can see your question. And we'll leave questions till the end. Martina, if you could keep an eye on the questions if I miss any. Sure. Great. So. All right, I had to pull this up just a few minutes ago. Can you see? All right, so about the Data Science Academy, we have both the boot camp as well as course bundles and individual courses. And the boot camp is depending on your preferred delivery format. It's either 12 weeks, 16 weeks, or 24 weeks. And I'll get more into it a little bit later. We're the only bootcamp that teaches both Python and R. The data analytics portion will be taught both in Python and R. And as you move into the machine learning portion, you will focus on Python. We have hands-on learning with four industry projects, which will assess comprehension of the modules and the material. We have job placement support. And in fact, we have lifetime career support in that you would be added to our LinkedIn network and you would have access to our extensive network of alumni and we would be happy to make introductions in an in industry of your choice. We have 2000 alumni working across the globe and for many years running, we've been rated highly in both switch up and course report. So, and apologies for this screen for mine. I actually had to move from my room to the living room because there was a lot of construction going on outside. And I had planned for this to be on my external screen, but you can see this here. Now to explain a bit about our bootcamp delivery format and options, please take a look at this. The upcoming bootcamps start dates. The upcoming one is July 6th for both the online format that you see here, full-time online and part-time online, as well as the in-person one. We are resuming classes on site starting in July. And you're on the agenda, right? Yeah, I just um, one of you should try to Urjan, I think your mic is on. So our online, our in-person format is 12 weeks and you would come to class, sit for two to three hours for lecture, you would break for lunch and then you would come back for the afternoon session. The balance of the afternoon would be for questions for your instructor, for the teacher's assistants to interact with your peers while working on assignments and projects. In addition to that, there are many other channels for interaction with either mentors or instructors in that throughout the bootcamp, there are almost daily office hours held where you can, if you're in person, you would attend the office hour. If you were online, you would attend the Zoom office hours. And as well, you can schedule one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions with people who actually work in industry. So 
unlike some of the other boot camps that might be out there, you can actually choose who you want to interact with. And if you so chose, it could be on a daily basis. You could schedule these one-on-one -on -one mentoring meetings where you could review homeworks, projects, get career advice, et cetera. So we are running a promotion for the upcoming July 6th cohort. And the application process is you would submit the application. We would review your application, schedule the interview, where we would go into more depth about your background and your qualifications. And then we would send you the technical assessment, which would be graded by one of our data science instructors. They would provide written feedback on areas they feel you did exceptionally well on, as well as areas that they think you might need to freshen up on before the start of the bootcamp. Or if they feel that you should take preparatory courses before enrolling in our bootcamp, they would also say so. So this would be the process for enrollment. And again, there is a 1700, uh, 1,760 discount if you decide to enroll in the July cohort coming up with the deadline of June 28th, June 18th, I'm sorry. If you have any questions, feel free to email admissions at this office or Martina will forward you my personal email if you want to get in touch with me uh, directly. Are there any questions? Okay, I see plenty of questions in chat. I don't... No, oh, these are comments. Yeah, there are comments. But yeah, if you guys have questions, you can directly email admissions at nycdatascience.com or Sophia's email that I'll write down. Okay, I'll write it down right here. Great, well, I'll give up the stage to you then, Martina. Thank you, Sophia. And um, yeah, I think David can start. Are you ready? I am. Um, let me just share my screen and let's see if this works. Uh, let's see, share the screen. Okay, turn on the presentation. Uh, you should be able to see my screen. The presentation looks okay? Yes. Oh, excellent, excellent. All right, so uh, welcome, thank you all. Thanks to the Academy for letting me present today. Um, I'm gonna talk today on how to web scrape job postings off of indeed.com using Python. Hopefully what you'll get out of this talk is an appreciation for what can be done with web scraping. Um, how to use the web scraper that I built. And to some extent, we're gonna talk about how I built the web scraper and some good coding practices. Uh, so one of the things that we did with this, um, I did with this prog uh, this um, application was to build the web scraper and I was able to um, generate this word cloud from many of the different job descriptions. So uh, for instance, you can look into it and see uh, some of the common words and phrases that um, people post for, like machine learning and analysis and research. But, uh, and I'll, I'll go into this a little bit later on, but um, there's a lot of things that you can do from scraping and uh, we'll talk about this as we go through the presentation. So uh, who am I, how do I get here, et cetera. I'm David Wasserman, um, I'm a lifelong learner. I enjoy taking my education and applying it to different problems and solving them. I was in the April, January to April 2021 cohort of the New York City Data Science Academy Bootcamp. Um, I have a background in finance, e-commerce, and technology. Um, part of me likes bad movies, comic book art, and uh, indulgence in poker. Uh, you can connect with me on through email, LinkedIn, GitHub. Uh, the GitHub is important. Um, you can, um, we'll go through this later on, but, um, will be able to download the project through my GitHub uh, repo repository. So I wanna go over the agenda, what we're gonna talk about today. 
Um, we're going to talk about an overview of web scraping. What is it? Why do we do it? How do we do it? Um, we'll scope out the target that we want to uh, scrape, which is indeed.com. We'll run the scraper and we'll do some code review. And then we'll look at some results and analysis that I've performed based on the scraping. Um, I imagine that we have a, a pretty diverse crowd here today. Some of you are probably more technical, some of you are less technical. Um, I'll try and keep it. If you have any questions, just feel free to speak up and uh, let me know. It's a little bit hard to check the chat. So um, just um, you can unmute yourself and just let me know if there's anything that I need to uh, answer while we go through this. So web scraping. Um, you know, the internet started as a method of sharing information back in the 60s and 70s as ARPANET, and then it grew oh, in the 80s and 90s into um, the World Wide Web. It evolved to much more than just sharing information. Like you can, you know, go to Amazon, buy books and, um, you know, <laughs> pretty much anything you want at this point. But largely it still exists as a data store. Um, fundamentally, on the internet, each page is composed of three things. Information, which is found mostly in the form of HTML or hypertext markup language format. Formatting, which is mostly found in the format of cascading style sheets. And interactive code, which is most often found as JavaScript. Web scraping is defined, I found on the internet, as uh, the automated collection of information from web pages. And since we're focusing on this automated collection, we're gonna be focusing on this information piece. And we'll be focusing on getting information off of this hypertext markup language, HTML format. So behind the scenes of a web page, uh, you see on the left, uh, a typical web page that is rendered in through a browser. Um, hopefully you can see the little, the, um, the address that I went to, it's scrapethesite.com. It's, it's a good place to go to if you want to just practice your web scraping. Uh, what happens is it takes the hypertext markup, the HTML um, code that's behind the scenes on the right, and the browser will take this information and make it in such a format that can be is nicer to look at. But you'll see that there's a direct corollary between the, the square, red square on the left and the red square on the right. You'll see that Andorra has a little flag. It um, corresponds with this little flag icon in this um, eye tag. Each of these in HTML, you have what are called tags, and the tags are surrounded by angle brackets. And you'll see that you have information within the tags, for instance, text like Andorra. And this Andorra corresponds with this Andorra over here. The capital over here with the capital of Andorra La Vea is the capital Andorra La Vea over here. And same thing with the population and the area. As far as uh, our next, our target goes, which is indeed.com, um, let's just talk about Indeed for a second, why I chose Indeed uh, for scraping job postings. Indeed, is a, it's a very popular website. It's used to um, find jobs and to find P applicants for jobs. And it basically used to connect people with each other, the companies with the applicants. Um, of all the job boards, Indeed has the most lenient terms and conditions. By that, I mean that you don't need a username and password in order to search its listings. Other places like um, LinkedIn, Glassdoor, which is owned by Indeed, for instance, actually require you to log in before you start searching. So um, while Indeed has a, what's called an application programming interface or an API, which is another way of scraping, uh, not scraping, but uh, of getting data, it's kind of limited when it comes to volume. So overall, it makes indeed a good candidate for using a web scraper. Um, and now let's, for a second, let's just open up a browser and I will show you, um, I'm gonna navigate to indeed.com. Oops, here we go. Indeed.com is, uh, so we just, we're here already, but um, we just type it into the address bar and first comes up. Um, 
we're going to type in the what in the what box. We're going to just type in data scientist. And the where we're going to keep it as New York, New York. And we'll click on this find jobs button. You'll notice up in the uh, address bar now it's changed. It has the domain of nd.com and then it has some routing information within that domain. Jobs, data scientist, and then what we entered into the, um, the search boxes of LinkedIn, of query of data scientist and location of New York, New York. You'll notice that this is URL encoded. So if certain characters are not applicable for um, a URL, things like spaces, commas, these have special meaning. So they get encoded in other ways. So the comma got encoded to be percent to C and the spaces were changed into pluses. We'll use this later on uh, when we're scraping the, um, the website. Now, you'll notice that we have um, job postings in each of these boxes. This is very relevant, and um, we're going we're gonna to look into these uh, when we go into it. Also, you notice that we have this sort by option, and we're going to sort by date rather than relevance, so we can get a better view of what's coming, um, what's out there, or a, full, a fuller picture, I should say. Um, and then you notice what happened to the URL is that it changed, it added a parameter to the query string called sort equals date. If we scroll all the way to the bottom of the screen, we'll notice that the results are paginated. So that means that you only see 10 results per screen, but we have this arrow that can take us to the next page. If we click on it, it adds another parameter to the query string called start equals 10. If we were to go to the bottom again and press it one more time, it'll say start equals 20. If we were to take this number and arbitrarily add a very large number to it, we see that it stops. It gives you a return, but it stops at page 62 and there's no more arrow over here to the right. And we can use this information later on as we're scraping the, the pages. Looking inside, if we look at one of these, um, these uh, job postings, for instance, for the New York City Data Science Academy, they have a job posting for data scientist, a data science instructor of big data. We can right click on this and open this link as a new tab. It's gonna show us um, the details of that job posting. So what we're gonna to wanna to do is go through each page and then we're gonna to want to go into each of these job postings and pick up information like the title, who the company is, as well as its URL, the number of reviews for the company and the number of stars, the location of the job. We we'll wanna pick up the job description, all this text. And then at the bottom, we see things like how long ago the job was posted, as well as the link to the original job um, on the, um, the company's website, if it exists. Um, so hopefully, are there any questions so far? Okay, I'm gonna go back to the uh, presentation at this point. And uh, I know that we've spoken about, um, oh, let me see. Um, I know that we spoke about going into the uh, URL, the GitHub URL. If you want, we can, um, you can grab the information at this point. Um, basically, you can either git clone the, uh, the repository, or you can navigate into the GitHub repository, and then there's a download button, and there's a green code button that uh, you can click on and then press download zip and you can, after downloading it, unzip the file. I'll just give you a little bit of time if you want to follow through with this. Um, hopefully it's pretty straightforward. And we'll just move on to the next step at this point. Uh, the URL is in the, um, is in the chat if you need it. Okay, I think that's good enough time. So the, 
project methodology, how we're gonna go about scraping the information. So there are three steps that we, uh, to going about the project, doing the project. We web scrape through a project, uh, a Python package called Scrapey. It's, um, it allows you to build a web scraper in Python. And then we utilize what's called a rotating anonymous proxy to increase scra scraping speed. So normally when you um, use the internet, you don't go through a proxy unless you're using a VPN or something like that. But most people just use their native address behind let's say a, a router or something like that. And then um, it goes out directly to the internet and then um, to the web page and then comes back. When I'm using a rotating anonymous proxy, the server, the web server on the other side doesn't know exactly who I am. So it allows me to increase the speed because it doesn't look like I'm one person pounding their server with uh, requests. Um, and then finally, as, after we get the information, we're gonna use natural language processing of the job postings to create things like a word cloud and other analyses. So in order to use the web scraper, um, I'm going to bring up the, um, I'm gonna bring up what's uh, Visual Studio Code. Oops. Give me a second. So in Visual Studio Code, um, there's a number of different, this is, this is a representation of the code that I built. And there are um, a number of different files in here and folders. Uh, am I losing people? It looks like it's a little bit unclear. Okay. Um, so the first you'll see is, is, is this Indeed folder, which houses the, um, the project itself. The project has um, a config file in it, which is what we're gonna use to uh, run the scraper. Um, the config file itself is composed of three um, variables. The job query, which is what job do you wanna search for? I've chosen data scientist, but it could be changed to CFO. It could be changed to um, business analyst. It could be changed to anything. I've got the locations that I'm searching. I'm gonna simplify this down to just be New York City. And I'm going to uh, comment everything else out. And then the proxy, this needs to be chosen. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna follow this link to the web, free web proxy, um, put this over to the right. And then um, scrolling down, We're gonna to wanna to choose the free, uh, free proxies in the US, unless you're in some other country. But, um, and we'll look for one that does an HTTP yes, because we're gonna be searching over HTTP. We'll copy this over as the IP address and then as the port. Uh, we'll save this over to the locally. And now we can run the web scraper. So the web scraper in, in Visual Studio Code is very simple to uh, run it from. So you can open up a terminal window, which we've done at the bottom here. It will already navigate to the, fo to the folder that we, um, which houses the project. Then we type in scrapey, crawl, indeed underscore spider, which is the name of the spider that I've created, dash L info. And what this is gonna do is it's going to um, just show logging information that's of the info level or higher. There's other info that it would, if I didn't leave this off, like debug information that just clutters up the screen. So we're gonna avoid that right now. We press enter and then hopefully it runs as we um, go about it. It just takes a little bit of time to start up. And um, let's see, 
just give it a second while it just keeps on going. Um, let's see. So now while it's going, I can just talk about the repository itself. And this will go into the code that while we're while it's running, the code will run. Um, I can talk about the different files in the in the repository. We have this indeed folder, which is where the scrapey code resides. We've got a data folder, which is where I put the results, like this indeed underscore spider.csv. Um, then we have these Python Jupyter notebooks that will show um, the analysis. And they all work off of whatever gets outputted into this indeed underscore spider.csv, which is the output of the scraping. Uh, we've looked at the config file. The init file is just, it, show, it uh, sets the project up as a Python package rather than a mere directory. It allows for an easier import of, file, of Python code. The items fold, the item file is very important. This sets up the, mo the model, the data model for what we're collecting. So we'll be collecting things like the things from the scrapey spider directly. And then we'll be collecting things that are below that are calculated off the scrape data. So things like the search page URL, the, um, the Indeed URL is the um, job posting URL. So that's where you click to, uh, you, you take that address and you would um, use that address to apply to a job or research the job more. I collect the job title, the name of the, the company as we saw earlier, the URL of the company, the review information, uh, location, description, um, and then some other information as well. From that information, we're going to post um, search location, we're going to parse out the search location. This I, Indeed job key is a, a unique ID for the job on indeed.com. The number of stars, the number of views. If it posts a salary, we parse that into a low end and a high end. And then the posting date is calculated off of when the job was posted. If it was posted a day ago, then the calculation is uh, May 7th. Um, the middlewares file is of code that overrides the scrapey crawling process. This allows for proxy address as well as handling redirects. So sometimes um, Indeed will send you to one path, and one uh, page, and then it will redirect you to another page. Um, it, all, it happens without it, your, your knowing. And in order to handle it efficiently, um, this I put in some code here that would um, handle that better. I call this the better redirect middleware. Um, the pipelines file is what cleans up the code, the results after we scrape. So I have two elements in here, a duplicates pipeline and a write item pipeline. The duplicates pipeline checks to make sure that it has a job key. And if the job key is present, that it's not a duplicate. If it does, if the job shows up on multiple pages, I don't want to see it multiple times. Um, if, and then finally, what is this right item pipeline is going to do is it's the code that's going to take the results and put it into that indeed underscore spider CSV file. Uh, the settings file is the last file in the main folder. This has some uh, parameters that Scrapey follows. Uh, things like how long it waits between re requests, this download delay. Um, by using the proxy, I was able to bring this down from five seconds down to one second. I could probably bring it down even further, but um, you, know, you wanna be a good citizen, so make it a little bit nice. Uh, one second seems to work pretty well as we're seeing, we're getting some results down here below. Uh, the other thing to notice is user agent. This identifies the, uh, it makes it seem like I'm running a regular browser instead of um, just a headless bot. So it looks like I'm running a Mozilla Firefox browser and I ran, this, I, I changed this code relatively recently. So it's uh, fairly up to date. The final bit of code is in the spiders folder, and it's this indeed underscore spider.py file. Um, this code is the heart of the soul of the scraper. So what 
the initial code does up here is import some libraries that I'm going to use to um, parse out, to collect the information through the scraper. And then there's some basic information from Scrapey as well as from other library, other files within the library. Um, the main class that I'm using to scrape is this Indeed Spider. And this is the name. This is the name of the spider. It's just a parameter that um, it's a property of the class. And that's when I was, I was typing crawl indeed underscore spider. That's why I used indeed underscore spiders because of this name. The custom settings tells it that you run these other pipelines. Um, just some information about which domain I'm scraping from. I use that later on. Uh, then we talk about um, the process. So the, it starts off with start requests. In order to do this, I take um, a string and where I'm gonna take the string, I'm gonna create using a list comprehension, I'm gonna create a, a set of lists that takes one, um, will create a list of URLs for each of the uh, job query. Well, I have one job query, but for each of the locations, it's gonna create another entry. So um, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna create uh, an entry for just for New York, but if I had all 11 uh, locations, it would have created one entry for each location, 11 entries in one list. Then for each of those URLs, it's gonna send out a request to this parse results page to start the querying for each of those first pages. Um, it's gonna look for the jobs on that page. So if we go back to, um, let's see, go back into the job post, the job posting, um, oops. If we go into here, it's gonna look for each of these job postings and it's going to uh, send out a request by, by essentially extracting the URL and opening a new request, a new page request. Let's see if we can move this on the other side. Yeah. So um, in order to do that, we use what's called an XPath in this case. It's a job pattern. Um, and then it's, it's using this response.xpath against the job pattern to get all the results. Then it just reiterates through each result and sends out a request to parse the job page. After it does that, it's going to look for that next button, which is what it does here, get the URL. And then if the URL exists, it's going to send another request to itself to parse that result, the next results page until there are no results page left. Or it encounters some, um, well, there's some checking in here for a captcha. Um, a captcha is essentially uh, a way of checking to see that a browser is not a bot or it is hu a human. So if you, if I did change that download delay to let's say a very low number, like zero, and just kept on um, sending out request after request after, after request, it might get suspicious even with the proxy. So, um, if it did that, if the, if the website detected that or it suspected that I was a bot instead of a human, it might send out a capture, one of the, and I'm sure you've all seen them, to, to um, check if I'm a human or, and not just an automated uh, crawler. So um, once we go into the parsing the job page, it goes through um, a couple of different steps to pick up information. Instead of the XPath um, format I used before, I find that the CSS selector is an interesting way of getting information. So the way that you read this is it takes the H1 tag and the dot means take the class which has the name job search dash job info header dash title and get the text within that uh, tag. That'll just pick up the first text and then it will assign it to the variable job text as a, as a string. The company, hello? Was there a question? Oh, okay. Uh, the company looks for this, um, 
it'll look for, let's go back. The, the company will look for this um, A tag, which is a um, uh, anchor tag or a link. If the company, if the company does not exist with the link, then what it's going to do is it's going to look for um, this other way of getting the information. This, there's two ways of getting the company, whether it has a link to a, another web page or it doesn't. And this is, uh, if it has the tag, then I pick up the company name, the URL and the reviews. If it doesn't, then I just pick up the company name. Um, I take the job location with some error handling here in case there's a problem. Um, then I take up the posted when block to see that there is, um, when, if we go into that, that site, as we saw before, we look for this block of, of uh, text and then I use a, a re regular expression to pick up when the uh, job was posted. Assuming it was, it, that information is there, I just pick up that text and I assign it to the variable posted when. If the salary exists, I pick that information up as well. The original URL, the same way. The response on meta is a dictionary, which takes all the information that I've collected and puts it into this response that meta dictionary, which I can, I can store and I will use in a later step. Uh, and then what I'm doing here is if the UR, original URL exists, I'm just following it a little bit down the road to, um, store, to store the item, uh, store the information into this response URL. Otherwise, I'm just assigning it to a none. Uh, finally, the last step is to store the item, um, which is taking the response that meta dictionary, and we store it in this indeed item, which is a cor a corresponds to what we saw in the items.py file. So each of those, um, excuse me, cat is <laughs> just jumped up. Um, anyway, so we're going to take the each each item that we scraped from the data dictionary gets put into this item um, key and stored into the item um, indeed item object. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do some calculated information. We're going to take the, um, the parse the URL and we're going to take off the, uh, we're going to unquote. It. So basically before, remember I spoke about URL encoding, this unencrypts it. So it takes the percent to C and we'll convert it back to a co uh, comma and the pluses will convert back into spaces. Uh, likewise, it'll do, um, it'll parse out the, from the query string, it'll take the job key, which is known, uh, uh, you'll see it as a JK equals. So if we look at over here on this web page, you'll see this job key equals over here. It just takes it and extracts that information off the URL. Um, likewise, we'll do the same thing for parsing the company reviews. So we'll take the number of reviews, number of stars, and then we'll put that into um, the dictionary and the item itself. Uh, salary is a similar step. Um, posted when is an interesting thing. So there's different ways that it can say when the job was posted. It can give you a date, uh, a days posted ago, or it can say just posted or today. If it says just posted or today, I assign that as days ago equal to zero. Otherwise I take out using a regular expression, the number of days it posted. If it's um, 30 plus days, I just assume it is 30 days. Then I calculate the number of days from today uh, ago, and that gets assigned to this item post date. I return the item and then that gets assigned into, um, that's one record in the results page, in the results CSV file. 
at, that, at this point, um, we pretty much covered all the code uh, that I wanted to show. And I wanted to go into just some of the results. Um, you know, so there are different things that you can do with this job posting information. And the results of the spider, while it is still running, um, I'm gonna just show you what it looks like after, after I collected it through Excel. Um, so this was, it shows up as a comma separate value and I've taken this file and just convert it to a table in Excel. You have all the information that we collected before. In the headers, you see that we have the company name, the reviews, text, the URL, the job key. The job description is interesting because it has the full uh, job listing. So I can just look at it in here or I can um, use Python to analyze the text. And if I want to, I can also just, if I want to apply to, let's say this flex job, I can just go into the Indeed URL, copy this, and then I can go into a browser and paste it in, paste and go, and it will take me to this new, this flex, um, job application in Austin, Texas. The, um, some other things you can do with this, as I said before, was you can build out a word cloud. So this uh, job description word cloud .ipnynb, Jupyter notebook file, you can run this code and it will, um, well, I, it's, not, it's still running right now, so it's not gonna run exactly as we want, but uh, let's see what happens if I click it on. Curious to see, we only have 327 or 284 different scraped items, but um, we can run through the code and it will uh, generate a word cloud similar to what we saw below. Similarly, we can do the same thing with like job statistics. So in the, um, if you were to look in the, uh, let's see, if we were to look into the end of the appendixes, um, we can see that there are some statistics that I ran back in February when I initially uh, did this project. It's different things on remote information, statistics for job uh, locations, um, education. So um, different jobs require different education levels. Uh, these are other things that you could look at based on the, um, the job description text. It's, it's all very interesting stuff that you can get out of just the, um, you can get out of the uh, text that you see by using different natural language processing. Um, at this point, I'm pretty much, I can, I can go through some of the other stuff that we've looked at, uh, that I've done with the job, the um, analysis of the job descriptions. Um, I don't know if there are any questions or anything that anyone else wants to go over. Hello? You know how, you, how long it takes usually to run this? It's a good question. Um, usually it takes for one, um, for one city, you know, if I just did one city, mm -hmm. uh, it can take approximately 11 minutes. Uh, if I do, depending on the city and depending on um, how many posts there are per that city. Usually what ends up happening is that I enter, I encounter some problems, uh, like, you know, it stops prematurely because there's mm -hmm. a capture, but it usually takes about 11 minutes. Right now it's taking a little bit longer for New York because New York has so many different um, yeah. possibilities. Um, yeah. If I change this to Phoenix, Arizona, it would be done. I see. Okay, in the chat, there's less guessing asking, could you have this 
done in a Jupyter notebook? Uh, yes. Well, there's two parts to it, I guess I should say. Jupyter notebook is, I have a Jupyter notebook that can run the, um, the uh, analysis, but you'll need a, a, a terminal window in order to run the, the scraper. So um, if we go to running the project, if we look at running the scraper, you do need to um, open a terminal window, navigate to the folder, type in this code, and then just watch it go. After it's done, then you can use Jupyter Notebooks to open up the Python, the Jupyter, Note, uh, Jupyter Notebooks that I've created. So it's a yes and no question. You do need to use some other things in order to run the scraper, but in order to, um, in order to use the analysis, then that's just Jupyter Notebooks is, is fine. Uh, I just want to say that's the first time I've seen Visual Studio Code used. I've heard about it. That's really cool. Thanks for turning me on to that. What a great thing you did here and, and what a useful thing. I think I can use it this weekend, actually. So thank you very much. Oh, yeah, I, I use it. Um, I usually run it like once every two weeks just to see what's out there for my own job searches. And as far as Visual Studio Code goes, um, yeah, I, I I really enjoy it. It's it's a great environment to work in. I was playing with it, uh, just you know, learning how to invoke the um, scraper through um, Visual Studio Code instead of doing it through uh, Anaconda prompts, which was always a pain because then you have to you know navigating to the folders is always a challenge. Um, you know, especially when you have a very uh, organized file system. Can you can you use it inside Anaconda? Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, you just need to have Python installed. Anaconda is just a, um, I mean, Anaconda is a, a package of Python uh, installations. David, could you, um, could you run that script from the Jupyter Notebook um, just using a, um, a, a, a sorry, a, a, a basically escaping out into a shell from the Jupyter Notebook? You probably, you know, you probably could use a, um, ex, a Exclamation mark, uh, Scrapey. Um, instead of doing it through terminal, you probably could. I haven't tried it, um, but I don't see why you couldn't. Thank you. Uh, one other question. Before you were talking about the volume of data run to the website, I was kind of curious a little bit about that. If you wanted to expand this to do something else, like, you know, for instance, hit one of the big, you know, advertising sites or you know, uh, public listed, you know, sites like Amazon or eBay or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. What are some of the considerations around that? And um... Okay, yeah, so I've, I've done some scraping on Amazon before. I use something called Parse Hub because, um, you know, scraping is great for a lot of things, but, um, you know, I, I found that when I was doing um, Amazon there's some advantages to having uh, some different types of scrapers. Uh, one of the things that you do have to watch out for is the um, captures. Um, and the way to get around that is to rotate your IP addresses like I did here and like I've done in Parsub. Um, Parsub, it's a click of a button here. It's a little bit more coding involved. Um, oh, sorry, David, I didn't follow that. What was, what was one of the things you have to look out for? for well, you have to look out for um, Amazon or one of these other websites detecting that you're a bot, um, that you're not a human interacting with the web page. Instead, you're a Python program that's making it look like you're a, um, a person. Okay. Thank you. That, that's the biggest concern that you have to watch out for. And the, and the way you do that is, like I said, you rotate your IP addresses, you put in delays. Uh, of course, when you put in delays, that limits the speed. And that's um, got its own issues if you wanted to get a lot of information. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the chat, Chuba says, um, how is Creepy different, better or worse than Beautiful Soup? Uh, it's a good question. So Beautiful Soup is a parser that takes in HTML. 
So you have to give it the HTML in order to, um, to use beautiful soup. Scrapey goes out and um, is, I think it's, it's sort of all encompassing. It goes out and uh, looks like a browser, goes out and scrapes the information and then puts it into, you can put it into some other format. Beautiful soup is just a part of that. Um, would be just, is, it isn't part of Scrapey, but it would be part of that whole um, process. Was that clear? Um, I see some other questions. Uh, so um, let's see, as far as demonstrating running on Jupyter Notebooks, um, let me see if I've got Jupyter Notebook open. I'm not sure I have. It just takes a while to, oh, I think I do have Jupyter. Let me just bring it up. Uh, as I mentioned, I've got a whole bunch of different subfolders. So I will just navigate to Uh, so let's say we go to the Jupyter Word Cloud. So if I were to just go to Jupyter Notebooks, it's just gonna open up. Um, it's the same thing as using Visual Studio Code in, in for the notebook work. It would be different for the .py files. Those you need, if you, wanted, if you want to, um, you need some sort of text editor or an integrated development environment like Visual Studio Code, an IDE uh, to interact with the stuff that I was showing earlier on the config.py file. Um, while this is just loading up, um, here we go. So, kernel. so this is what it looks like in Jupyter Notebooks. Same thing as we saw before. So you had a question about how to scrape a single page application, uh, Chuba. That's an interesting question as well. So it really depends on the single page application. Uh, most of them use uh, URL routing. So as long as they, um, as long as they do, it's very straightforward. You just give it the URL and then um, you make the changes and it looks, it just navigates through the web page. It loads it up. It's really not, um, there's nothing you have to do special for a single page application. Uh, if you've got, instead of a query string, I forget what the other, is, uh, post information, it's a little bit different. Um, you'd, have to, you'd have to set that up a little bit specially. You can also use Selenium, which is another application. Um, oh, uh, let me see. So if you detect your block, will your IP address get blocked? Uh, it could actually, they, sometimes if they, uh, that's why I use, I use the proxy so that they don't know that it's coming from my, my address. If they detect it on my bot, they might just block you for some time. They might just throw up captures at you for some time. It's just a little bit of it. Um, it's just better. It's better to use proxies if you're scraping is in my opinion, unless you're scraping something that's fairly innocuous. Uh, if Parsub is better than for some things, why you scrape it? Uh, Parsub's great. I love Parsub, but it's expensive. So, uh, it, it, you know, there's a free tier, but it's very slow. If you want to actually, you know, it was a, it was a professional project that I used Parsub on. So that's why, um, you know, it was the client um, pays for it. So that's why it, uh, I use Parsub for that project and scrape you for this project. Uh, it's a question of um, who's gonna pay for it. And uh, I'd rather pay for free for Scrapey. Uh, can Scrapey or Parsub work on dynamic websites when certain parts of the page are hidden beyond, behind JavaScript? Actually, yes. And well, it depends on how this, the information is presented. If, the, uh, if it requires the page to load um, and to use JavaScript, Parsehub can do it. Um, it just, and Scrapey probably wouldn't be as good. Selenium would be better because if it's loading up um, after, and it, it requires JavaScript integration, you'll need the browser interaction. And um, Scrapey just looks at the HTML, whatever's loaded up when you first start. Um, 
when you have to click on something and then it does something else, you know, it does what's called AJAX, asynchronous JavaScript across XML, um, then um, scraping would not be so good. Parse up, yes, will do it though. Uh, Selenium would also be a good alternative. Uh, hello? Hi, uh, this is Wei Xing. I actually have a question. Uh, when you generate the item into dictionary, um, I didn't see you try to use try catch. Uh, how do you handle the error if the item is not exist? Because the that will force the program to stop. Uh, it depends. Sometimes, what I do is if it's a none, it doesn't stop. If, oh, so uh, I, it I just do Oh, go ahead. Your codes, I don't think I see a try catch. Uh, let me see. Unless I think the there are some is... try catches, but it okay. depends on where where it is. Because like right here, um, the posted when, um, a lot of this, like I had a try catch here for job location. Right. But otherwise, if you use gets, if there's nothing on the page, it doesn't match. It provides a none. And so then you will, so you will automatically provide the non to a uh, non value to that basically key since you use the uh, dictionary. Correct. And then I just put it in. The problem is with like this code where I have a try catch, a uh, try accept block, is because I have to use the. Um, I use the next to last item, and if it's a none, there's no next to last item. Right. Yeah, I, I got confused because uh, I guess I used Selenium more than Scrapey because uh, I was actually like about half years ago, I was using Selenium to um, to scrape a dynamic website. And what they handle is that mm -hmm. each website is actually unique. So instead, I cannot use Scrapey because Scrapey is using for more statics websites. So if the website is constantly ch changing, I have to use Selenio, actually write down some kind of uh, condition detections in order to script through different websites. So yeah, that's why I use a lot of uh, try catch. It's just that it's kind of weird that I don't see that you use that much things, you know, you use uh, scripting. I guess it's just a uh, different syntax. Yeah, it's a little bit different. I mean, you know, usually when you do designing a web page, you try not to make too many changes. Um, you know, if it's dynamic, I guess I can see what you're saying. But right. even then, um, if you use CSS selectors a lot, you know, there's usually a way of selecting the information in a better way. It does get, if they do have a lot of JavaScript interactivity, and it's more of a, it is more of a dynamic website that doesn't change the URL, then I can see using Selenium. Um, but a lot of information, you know, I guess there's some other cases where if you have to log into the website, but then that gets into other issues because then you're talking about terms and conditions. Right. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, sorry. Uh, it's more like uh, I have to, so I have to, um, I have to generate a list of CD like where you did and uh, I have to actually put the city into the search bar because the search bar doesn't uh, react exactly the way as in this. So I basically have to force that key word to be append into the search bar in order to generate the results. And after that, every website, it's just one URL, uh, just one URL. What they did is they changed the elements on the website. So I, I was forced to use Selenium. Mm, they might, it, I mean, I have to look at it, but I, I wonder if you couldn't have used uh, post headers instead of uh, query strings to get to the next pages. Um, yeah, I, I, I have I have only have experience with Beautiful Soup, Scrapey and Selenium. And by the, back then, you know, my, my best solution was I have to use Selenium to do that. Yeah, I mean, Selenium makes things easy. It's just that um, you're going to take a hit as far as performance goes because it has to load up the entire page. That's true.
But yeah, um, for for the uh, for someone's question, uh, if you want to script a website, always always use uh, Prezi or VPN because you don't want your IP address to get banned. Just yeah, in case I mean, you need, just in case in the future, if you need to visit the website again. Yeah, I would probably say the best way of doing this is to um, to use like a rotating proxy, like the one I was using. Um, it's a good idea in general. Let me just put my information up here while we're talking. Um, yeah, it, it's a good idea in practice. It's the best practice, I would say, if you want to. Um, if you want to scrape a, with a high amount of, uh, of performance. A VPN is, of course, is good too. Um, you know, that's, that's another way, but usually it depends on which VPN you're using, I would imagine, to know which, um, where you're coming out of. And also a VPN, you could, um, you could, um, you could be, let's say, searching from Europe, even though you're sitting in the States, or you could be, you know, a VPN makes it look like you're someplace else altogether. The ones that I chose were in the United States, um, my proxy server, so. Is, is there any VPN you would recommend? That's my first exposure to that. How do you find a, a good VPN? Oh, uh, well, VPNs are great. A VPN, I mean, if you're talking about VPN for personal use, or are you talking about for uh, for scraping purposes? Probably scraping. For scraping, I would use um, in my code. I've got the um, let me see where I put it. Uh, let's see this free dash proxy dash list dot net. I'll put it in the chat. That's really good if you're doing a, you know, if you're uh, scraping. If you want a VPN, I mean, it's a, diff it's a different story. Um, there are popular VPNs like NordVPN and use these things for protecting your privacy when you're, um, when you're su surfing in general. I have a question. Uh, how uh, how often do you need to change the proxy, or uh, is it better to uh, to create another function to script a free proxy from the that website? Like yeah, uh, um, the proxy needs to be changed regularly. Like every time I run it, I go out and, and check the proxy because these this is a free list and it doesn't um, you know it doesn't last very long. Uh, if we go to that website, we can you can even see that you know. Um, let's see. Go to the website. You'll see that it has a, a timer. Um, how long the proxies have been up and when it was last checked. So you see this. These are last checked two minutes ago, and you've got all these different countries. I know we have someone from Brazil here, so you know it's a pretty good list. And then you can just check in here for just U.S. proxies. Are there any other questions? I know we're a little bit over time. Okay, I'll just give a little bit um, of a speech and then we can see what David has in mind. So um, I hope you guys had fun today and you guys learned new things. And uh, this was one of the four projects that the NYC Data Science Academy requires for the students in the book camps. And uh, as Sophia said, who was our admission officer, uh, our next cohort is starting on June, July 6th. And we have now an early bird promotion until June 18th. So there's gonna be like a 10% discount if you um, um, register before the June 18th. Uh, I'll send the website in the chat. And uh, if you guys are in the New York City area, starting the next cohort, so July 6th. Uh, we are also gonna have in-person book camps so that you guys can follow along as well. 
because I know that um, David's David's one was on remote, right? Yeah. Due COVID, yeah. Mm -hmm. So starting July first, we might have like in person hybrid boot camps as well. And I see that some of you joined in joined joined in late. So um, if you want, I can send. Uh, you guys can leave your email in the chat so I can send you the notes and the give the links and also um, the video recap so that you guys can rewatch it later on as well. And I might need you to fill in a survey so that uh, we know what you guys want to learn next or ways to improve our events. Yeah, feel free to leave your email so that I can send you all the documents that we went over today. And it's free, don't worry. <laughs> and I should say that um, th both this presentation and the previous presentation um, are up on the GitHub repository. Um, and if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out to me. Any opportunities also feel free to reach out to me. Um, my information is on the screen. So thank you very much for attending. This has really been fun. And I also send it in the email that you guys are gonna receive if you leave the email in the chat. Yeah, I'm gonna send also David's information because um, he's looking for a data scientist position as well. So if you guys have like um, recommendations or networking um, experience, you can also like share with him. Thank you. <laughs> Great presentation, my friend. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I agree. Thank you. Appreciate it a lot, David. Thank you so much. You guys have other questions? Or mm. yeah. David, do you have anything else to say? Uh no, I'm pretty good. Thanks, thanks everyone for attending. I really do appreciate the good turnout. Yeah, it was really interesting. And if you guys want, you can uh, follow our social media, social media account. We have like all the platforms, and you just Google NYC Data Science Academy, so that like you can stay tuned for further events. Yeah, we we host events like every week about data science, so you can join. Okay. Thanks, David. Take care. Thank you for appreciating. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, guys. Thank you so much, David. It was like a really good presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna close the room if um, you guys don't have questions. Oh, yeah. Nice meeting you. I'll close it, okay? <laughs>